um, today I want to talk about um, biometric sensing, sensing signals from the body, and kind of wax a little philosophical and speculative about what the future looks like for biometric sensing and how we may use that to augment our cognition and then how we might do how we, how we might make that more accessible to more people and really democratize that technology so it's, it's serving everyone. Um, a, a little bit about my background. Um, I got my PhD in neuroscience in 2009, uh, studying uh, memory and how oscillations in the brain uh, serve in coding and retrieval functions. Um, and since doing my PhD, I've I kind of shifted gears out of um, academic science into um, industry, where I've tried to kind of bridge um, academic and industry type research uh, a bit, and I'm going to talk about some of that today. Um, so my current venture is I run a technology consulting company, um, and we help people send signals from the body, among other things. Um, I also have taught over the years at a number of places, um, so I try to keep um, one foot grounded in, in education and um, uh, gaining that sort of perspective um, and inspiration from the students. Um, and then I also work as a new media artist. Um, and a lot of my new media art is actually biofeedback art, sensing signals from the body and doing stuff with it. So um, these are some examples um, of my work in the past. Uh, there's one called Vital Threads Biofeedback Apparel um, that sensed um, electrodermal activity and lit up a, uh, a wristband, which I'm actually wearing today. So when it's blue and calm, and then if I smack myself, it lights up red because I got uh, angry about that. Um, a shirt that flashes with my heartbeat and a hat that uh, lights up with my brain activity. Um, and then I've also um, uh, created an installation that um, when you touch it, uh, picks up your heartbeat and lights up the room and kind of uh, uploads things to the internet and kind of asks the question where the human body is, is ending and where the internet begins. Um, and then um, there's also a, a piece called Hive Mind, which um, picked up brain waves from two performers and then flashed a screen behind them. Uh, that the other performer looked at it and trained their EEG oscillations and sort of created this kind of direct brain-to-brain -brain through light communication, um, which actually debuted at the Rixi Art Science Festival uh, a few years back. Um, so that's, that's kind of some of my background. Um, and what I really want to talk about today is um, this kind of more speculative, futuristic idea of augmented cognition. Um, and how that's already in the present um, to an extent. Um, so I think uh, I wrote an article with some um, folks in Patty May's lab at MIT this last year um, on this topic, and you, you can check that out if you want some more uh, detail. But basically, in the future, um, it's very likely that signals from the body combined with machine learning are going to be changing aspects of our reality. Um, they already do, but it's going to increase probably at an accelerating pace. Um, and, and so, so I'm, I'm interested in what that means. Um, and so, so just to sort of contrast, contrast that with what, what is currently possible, possible uh, last year, there was a paper that came out that used machine learning to predict psychosis. Psychosis is a is, is devastating. Um, going and having a psychotic break is devastating for the person. Uh, it disrupts their lives. It disrupts the lives of their friends and family around them. Um, so to be able to predict it and potentially intervene um, would uh, make a really big difference in a lot of people's lives. Um, and um, it's an interesting idea to think about predicting and intervening into psychosis. Um, we're, we're now um, raising the specter of who, who was in control, who's creating that algorithm, uh, who's flipping the switch, uh, what is that intervention, um, you know, is it, is it driven by a drug company, for example, um, what are their motivations, um, and I think also 
what's possible right now and what's going to become more and more prevalent is the idea of reality filtering. Um, so if you, for example, uh, it's really easy to use computer vision to detect a donut um, these days. So if you're trying to be more healthy, maybe you want to block donuts from your augmented reality or your virtual reality um, view so that you can be healthier. Um, and so I think this is a powerful way to kind of uh, co cognitively intervene into the stimuli that are going to trigger you. Um, it would also be interesting if Dunkin' Donuts had um, control over this algorithm um, and if they were picking up your biometrics and identifying when you were creating a donut and then maybe a, a, a Dunkin' Donuts ad would pop up. Um, so there's there's kind of this this duality, um, and I'm I'm really interested in what separates these kind of utopian versus dystopian futures. Um, and I don't think there's any one thing. I think there's a lot of little things. Um, but one thing I've been thinking about is really bringing more voices into the conversation about what, what biometrics mean, how they should be used, and including perspectives um, from researchers to artists, first world, third world, um, uh, disadvantaged, um, advantaged, and really bringing everyone together and making sure that these technologies are representing everyone's voices um, and and, serve, and and hopefully serving everyone to the to the greatest degree possible. Um, and so, you know, kind of dovetailing that with my life in technology, um, I've been waiting for over a decade for somebody to make a. Um, uh, biometric, a device that can pick up research-grade biometric signals uh, at an affordable price and really deliver the, the, the data in a form and in, uh, of an integrity that allows you to go deeper into it and not um, stay at kind of a superficial consumer level. Um, and what I've what I realized over the years is that there was there was kind of this research grade bucket, which tended to be expensive um, and uh, had good signals, sometimes wearable, sometimes less wearable. Um, and, and then there's a consumer grade bucket, which tended to have impoverished signals. You tended to need to give your data over to the largest corporations in the history of the world, um, and a number of other drawbacks. Um, and so, at some point, it hit me. Uh, duh. Um, you know, maybe the reason it doesn't exist is because um, my lab needed to make make it, um, and so that's how the idea of a motivate um, was born uh, out of the notion that it's a weird set of skills and motivations that goes about building this kind of cheaper, super high quality wearable sensor um, to pick up all these signals that nobody really knows what to do with entirely yet. Um, but I was really motivated to democratize biometric sensing because uh, I wanted something that was super easy to, to get people in the door. Uh, you know, I wanted to be wearable, easy to use, um, open source, have high quality, high value data, um, and give the data to the user. Um, uh, let them own it completely and let them send it places if they want. Um, and also make it affordable. Um, the, a fraction of the cost of many of the research grade devices on the market. Um, so that researchers and artists and DIYers and personal health enthusiasts and educators and students, everybody could be a part of that conversation about what these signals mean and what they should be used for, how, what they should control about the world. Um, and so key to that was making it easy to use. Um, and um, so I'm going to fire up. Uh, I've, got, I've actually got an emote on uh, my finger right now. Um, you, you, uh, we tried to make it really easy to put in a number of places. And I'll show you examples of wearing it on the forehead. We had a collaborator in Canada make a 3D printed case so they could put it on snowboarders on their calf um, and a variety of other things. Um, but 
the but right now this is measuring from my finger um, and and this is my data coming live um, over the signal so you can see if I move around the um, the IMU data is going to be moving around over here you can see my um, my heartbeats coming through um, this is my electrodermal activity um, so if I uh, smack myself um, you'll see a little bit of a delay um, and then, uh, let's, let me see, uh, I may be, um, I was up late trying, uh, on Skype calls with China last night, so, um, it's possible my, my biometrics are a little wackadoo. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so, um, so, and, and then there's also, a uh, body temperature sensor, um, and, uh, all this data is streaming live, um, and also being recorded to an SD card, um, on the device itself for high integrity and, and, and really high ownership. Um, I took some notes um, in uh, Jonah's talk. I'll take a note right now. Um, we'll just say oscilloscope, uh, shorthand. Um, and so now that note is being logged directly onto the SD card as well. Um, and we're working on making it easy to send the data elsewhere. Um, I'll show you an example of sending that data over OSC, uh, which is a common uh, stream that artists use uh, to uh, send data around. Uh, but we're also working on opening up other uh, channels so that um, whatever channel makes sense to you, you know, we can we can make it work. Um, it's kind of our hope. So. So that's just a little bit about the, the what a motivit looks like, um, and then this is an example of a motivit being um, used last. Uh, I guess it was last summer. Um, Artahack, um, in the middle of a pandemic, um, pulled together people from uh, hackers from around the world to dial into a dance studio in New York where a dancer had the emotive bit, um, there were actually two dancers, this is one of them on his body, um, and then the hackers would, uh, would gather that data live and manipulate it um, and, and use it to manipulate this um, virtual um, environment that you see here. Um, and so his signals were, were triggering things like sounds and um, the, and, and the, uh, the colors of words and things like that. And then that culminated in, um, a, uh, in this. There's no sound. Thank you. Uh, how do I do that again? Share sound? Sure. Yes, yes, share sound. Cool. And by Rasvan Stoya draws on language to describe the perceptual experience of otherness. I'm going to skip ahead so you can see the, uh, the next performer. The next presentation, performed by Hussein Simko, examines an individual's journey of finding mental strength and resilience in the face of adversity and chaos. So this was just a very short clip. If you go to this um, Vimeo uh, link here, you get a full 16-minute um, compilation of the performances that were broadcast live on this awesome uh, platform called Electron. 
Um, and so we've been working with um, artists and educators and um, uh, researchers um, and quantified selfers um, and have been really fortunate that people have, it's, it's really resonated with a number of people to, to have this access to high quality data um, and be able to start doing things with it. Um, and, you know, we're just starting with this one step in a staircase and hoping to expand this into larger, a larger biometric ecosystem um, that, that allows people to share code and data and, and lots of other things as well. Um, and you can see we've worked with um, every, uh, all kinds of folks from industry to, to academia, uh, research, education. Um, and the hope is that through this, people will start asking more questions and maybe ask better questions bring new contexts and perspectives, um, and uh, consider the future, consider the, the ethics uh, of all of this um, at a younger age, um, and really kind of immerse ourselves in these concepts. Um, and we've been really fortunate this last year, we launched on Kickstarter and um, were successfully funded, um, and OpenBCI is now uh, pre uh, in pre-order at OpenBCI. Uh, dot com, um, where we're going to start shipping, uh, we're ready to sh start shipping in February. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, as I mentioned, I'm recording my biometric data right now. I'm going to post it on social media uh, from this talk. So um, if anybody wants to look at my react, uh, listen to my reaction and then view it in, in uh, biometric signals, um, that will also be possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, so no time for the one or two questions, please. I have a question, Sean. Because you have to work with a very sensitive uh, which is biometric capturing by the data and interpreting data, which uh, as um, Ellen and John before you mentioned that it is very difficult in, when it comes to ethics, but also on the BS uh, that are about the algorithms to, to conclude the data. And when you, when you show the project of uh, anticipating when someone has a break, the mental breakdown, and how I remember a bit after a while, like there is not such a single bad publicity, and uh, what in addition to what John uh, mentioned, but once the technology, no matter how bad it is, uh, is installed in the fiber of society, it stays there for decades and centuries. So it's so bad because, like, okay, this is very dangerous because uh, if you can detect uh, when someone is having a breakdown, actually, years ago, I did a theater piece about it. But in a very ironic uh, context, uh, that uh, people can try to use as a breakdown to transform us in weapons. Uh, like, uh, I mean, it was over the CIA capturing people when it is on the border of becoming suicidal to use them as weapons. But that's the thing, like, uh, instead of capturing, isn't it better to research technology that can prevent? Well, so, you know, I think, I, I think that's an important part of the conversation uh, as well. Um, my, what, what I've kind of come to over time is that this is not going to be stopped. Uh, and the reason isn't because, you know, of some big bad company or whatever. Uh, but the reason is that it, we're, we're going to want it um, because there's going to be so much possibility that comes from it, just the same as stopping the written word or stopping the hammer. You know, I think that it's a tool and it's going to come. And I think one of the drivers is going to be, if, if you're able to have your information filters be highly tuned and you're able to, to buy stocks better than the next guy, you're going to do it, um, right? 
Uh, if you if you if, if you can be the smartest person in the room on, on the stock room floor, you're going to wear these biometrics, and 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 I think that's going to be true across disciplines and across industries and, and uh, to a large extent. So so that's you know when uh, when I started thinking about that, that's when I started thinking about how more than whether than if, um, and and started thinking about how to move the needle into, you know, slightly to the utopic direction. Um, it's, I, I don't think, I think it's going to be messy, but, but, but I, I think with some principles, you know, open source being one of them, I think that will be helpful having more voices. I think, you know, that's how I'm thinking about it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Okay, one, one question, question was great. Uh, so, so we thank, thank you, Sean and Gay, okay. and so we, we move, move to, to the, the next presentation, presentation. today. In sense of some